what I want to do, and I know it's like, what, third week in January, this is, this is what, what I think of schedules right now, but today, I want to set the table for what we're doing this whole year. Uh, actually, Josh has already started this in our classes, um, Origins, this idea of beginnings, in the beginning is, is a genesis. We, we want to just kind of go back to, and I found this really perfect, having come out of all the writings of John last year, how does the Gospel of John begin, but in the beginning? John's kind of showing you that all things that Christ was doing were not, were not new, they were not undeveloped, it was not this kind of shock to our system, but that if you go back to the beginning, God has always had this purpose and this plan, and so we want to tie some of those things in, and as a gospel this year, instead of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're actually going to take on what Paul would call his gospel, the book of Romans, at the end of the year. And what Paul does is he uses all this genesis or beginning or origin language. And so hopefully this is all kind of building toward what we're doing throughout the year. And what I want all of you to recognize for our main theme is that everything begins with God. This is the whole point of the message. In fact, if you want to, this year, I would pick out not, not only a theme idea, but this theme passage. And I would love it if you would kind of put to memory, and it's, it's not long. We've memorized longer passages than this. Some of you might have it already done. But Colossians 1.16, Paul again, writing, using Genesis language, says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And if you want to take that on from a paraphrased version, I would use this one. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. And that's really what Origins is all about. That, that, that life and all the sequence of events that we face, all the circumstances outside of our control, all of those, even in those random moments, we can find our purpose in God. It had been a long time since I had kind of gone through Rick Warren's once very popular book, Purpose Driven Life, and, and this year early, I just thought, oh, I want to kind of read through that again. It was actually 1980 when that thing came out, which is shocking to me. Uh, I thought that was a current book, uh, but I went back through it. Uh, and as I did, I liked his approach to the idea of seeking for, searching for purpose. He actually boils it down to, to two approaches. And the first approach he says that most people use, and by most people he's widespread, all most people know about finding purpose in life is what he calls the speculation principle. You just, you just kind of look for it wherever you can. And, and, and you can think about the randomness of that or the frustration of that, of just finding purpose or trying to find it in a relationship or in a job or, or in an item or an object. And, and there's just kind of this chaos approach. I, I like the word speculation because it makes me think of those, those early 49ers who made it out to the West Coast because they heard someone found gold in the water. And so they all started panning for gold. They were speculating. Now, it was really disappointing to the most of them. That's the history behind it. And the same thing is true when we try to find purpose outside of God. Dr. Hugh Moorhead wrote this, this tiny little book, which is a gem, by the way. Um, it, it's all about what the meaning of life is. And, and if I ever write a book, this is the way I'll do it. This is what he did. He just wrote 150 philosophers scholars, the, the smartest, what we would call wisest men of our age, and said, what would you say the meaning of life is? What is life's purpose? And that was the bulk of his book. Now, some of them wrote back and were honest and said, but just so you know, I just kind of made up a purpose. Uh, some pontificated, as many wise men are prone to do, said, this is what the purpose is. And some were very honest and said, hey, we have no clue. In fact, there were several, he said later on, that wrote him and said, by the way, if you discover what it is, would you write us back? We'd like to know what the meaning of life really is. Now, I want to just say that, that speculation is one way to go about finding purpose, but thanks be to our in-the-beginning God, there is an alternative to speculation, and that is revelation. That's the second thing that Rick Warren brings up in his book, that, that God would actually show us or define for us what purpose is all about. So we can turn to what God has revealed about life in his word. That the easiest way to discover how anything works is to go to its creator and ask, how does this work? And the same thing is true about life. Discovering your purpose is possible when you ask God, the creator of your life. And so today, to set up our 2022 theme, 
origins. We're going to look at the depth of meaning in the first four words in the Bible. That's Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. Now, I just, I'll kind of start out this way because it's kind of fun. Uh, some books have such famous opening lines that if somebody says those lines, you know exactly what book they're talking about. And some of you readers are already excited. We're going to play this game. And so here we go. Um, it, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Right. Yeah. No, I, and that's a great tagline, by the way, for the book of Judges, which we'll be going through this year as well. Really, really symbols what the tale of two cities says. Um, here's another one. And, and I, I hope most of you know this one. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. I know Mike Sink would nail this one. Uh, anybody? No? Nobody. Pride and prejudice. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, an easier one for you. Call me Ishmael. The most famous line of a book so few people have actually read through, right? Moby Dick is that one. I'll, I'll give you one last one because this is fun for me at least. Um, there was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. It is C.S. Lewis, it is from the Chronicles of Narnia, and it is the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, right? So, okay, so, so here's one. As memorable as all those are, I hope you understand this one. What book starts like this? In the beginning, God. You guys ought to all say the Bible. I'm sorry, I thought that would be more unanimous. Um, <laughs> we're not debating this. So you could turn it and, and look. In the beginning, God. The first four words of the Bible. And here's what I'm going to tell you this morning, is that in those four words are these four foundational principles for us to live by. And I want to show you bit by bit how this works. And so the first, I would say this, that God is at the center of everything. That's the message of this book. These opening words show us what God is up to in the beginning. It is significant that the Bible does begin with God. This highlights the centrality of God. In the beginning, God. If there is one thing that the Bible tells us from the very beginning, it is that it's all about God. And by inference, it's not about us. He's the focal point of all things. God is at the center of it all. The universe in which we exist is what scientists call a heliocentric universe. That's the word for sun, by the way, not, not helium short. Sun. The sun is at the center of our universe. And we understand this, I mean, as much as we, we can, that, that the solar system as we live in, everything revolves around the sun, all the planets, everything. The sun gives us light, and without it, nothing could live. The sun is central in our universe, is the idea. Everything revolves around it. But did you know that for many years, people thought the Earth was actually the center of the universe? And so trying to figure out how all that worked, that everything kind of revolved around the Earth, made a lot of things difficult to understand. Now, all those problems, widespread misunderstandings, um, could only be settled when people finally understood widely, oh no, it's not revolving around us, it's revolving around the sun. I'll say this, one of the issues that people face today is that they've made the same error about the spiritual center of the universe. We tend to, as human beings, be egocentric. That's ego, not ego. It means I. It means that all these billions of people living on this planet tend to lean toward the idea that all that happens and all that goes on must be about me. And I'm saying there's an error in that, much like the misunderstanding of humans early on. See, we want a God that revolves around us. We, we want a religion that revolves around us. We want to read a Bible that's all about us. We, we, we just, we can't help but put ourselves in the center of all things. But life is not egocentric. It's theocentric, that is, God-centric. God is at the center. To find purpose, to find meaning, we've got to understand, much like the sun in our universe, our life must revolve around God. In the beginning, God. Now back to that 1980s book uh, from Rick Warren, The Purpose Driven Life. He said people like to dislike uh, lots of things in life as far as purpose goes. We pick our likes and our dislikes. But the very opening words of this particular book that I loved, he said, it's not about you. There's another opening line to remember. He's just dead on. It's not about you. Things don't all revolve around me. What I think, what I want, what's most comfortable to me, what's best for me. And just like there were many things in this earth that didn't make sense until people realized our, our system is built around the sun. There are a lot of things in our life that will never fit together in our marriages, in our families, in our jobs, in our religion, 
in so many areas of our life until we understand that life doesn't revolve around me. There's something bigger. There's something with greater purpose in this. I am not the center of the universe. God is central to all these things, and I will never really get these right in my life until God has his rightful place in my life. I'll tell you, in the book of Genesis, one of the greater things you're seeing is this. God is not just saying, I created it all. He's saying, are you willing for me to bring purpose into your life? And that's the invitation of Genesis, which makes our second point in these first four words, that God is present everywhere. Also, in the very beginning, the Bible lets us know some things about this God. It's all about God. The Lord our God is one God, the true God and united God. Now, there is something so profoundly unique about our God, something that is revealed, by the way, from the very beginning. The in the beginning God is one God who is also somehow a plurality. Now, think about this. The very word that the Bible uses of God here in Genesis 1.1 is the Hebrew word Elohim. This is actually in Genesis used in the plural form. Now, we know this kind of looking backward, that, that the three personalities in the Godhead are, are not something hidden in Scripture. That God, from the very beginning, was revealing this idea about his uniqueness as God. And it's evident from the beginning. Verse 2 of Genesis 1 speaks of the Spirit of God moving upon the surface of the earth. This is God, and yet somehow distinct from God. Then in verse 26, as we looked at this morning, this Elohim God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Think about this. That plural is used three times in that verse. Us, our, our. It is as though God is speaking in conference among himself. And that's exactly what's going on in the pages of the very beginning of the Bible. But right here in the beginning, the first words of the first book of the Bible, we find these incredible details. Telltale signs of one of the most important things we'll ever learn about God in Scripture. That he is a three-person God. And, and again, this is a huge concept that you can spend your life trying to get around. What theologians have come up with is the term triune. Triune is a word that simply means three in one, or I, I kind of like saying better, three but one. We've often heard the term Trinity, right, when people talk about the Godhead. I, I would just tell you this, the word Trinity is nowhere found in the Bible, but the doctrine of the Trinity is all over the Bible. The Bible strongly and clearly teaches in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, that the Lord our God is one God. There is one God, but Scripture also tells us very clearly that this one God exists eternally as three distinct persons. And so we read about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You think about this. Jesus calls God his Father, and God calls Jesus his Son. Yet not only is the Father God, but John 1 makes it clear that Jesus also is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. And here in Genesis 1-3, we read that the Spirit of God, whom the New Testament tells us, is God, is also a distinct person as well. And so the Bible clearly teaches us that God is a triune God, one God who exists eternally as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I would just say this, that's not a small matter. The Christian belief in a three but one God is what separates us from all religions of this world. Most religions believe in some kind of deity, some, some form of a God. But only Christians believe in a three but one God who brings us salvation. And this is how we would tell that story. A, a father God who loved us and sent God the Son to die for us, to save us on that cross so that God the Holy Spirit could come and live in us and help us in this life. See, no other religion believes that. And so we read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it's, it's no accident that this most well-known verse of the Bible has this idea in it. God the Son. God the Father. God the Son. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. God the Father gave God the Son that we might be saved. Right there in the most basic verse on salvation, you see more than one personality in this Godhead. And so it's important to recognize this truth. 
And I would say this, this is not just a matter of believing some teaching that somebody says is important. The Bible says that the God who will really save you is this three but one God. Now, if you need to be saved, you need to know who's going to do the saving. You need to know who to call, who's going to show up. And the Bible tells us clearly, this is the God who will save you. All the gods and the religions that you'll encounter in this life will not save you. The one God who will save you is the three but one, one God who exists eternally as Father, Son, and Spirit. Here is where salvation can be found. And so we should say with the early Christian theologian Gregory of Nazianzus, when I say God, I mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, when Christians talk about God, we need to know we mean that this God of three personalities is who we're dealing with, three persons. As you read through Scripture this year, and I hope many of you will take on this new year, this idea of reading through the Bible, you will find God defining himself in his personality of Son, Spirit, and Father. And I hope you'll see that. You'll find it taught on every page, including right here on the very first pages of Genesis. From the beginning, God shows us that he is three but one. He is everywhere. And third lesson from this text is that God created everything in purpose. This is one of the big, again, takeaways from the opening of the Bible. Are you looking for purpose? Are you looking for meaning? Do you want to know what life is all about? It all begins with God. God has created you for purpose. And so what is the first thing we learn about this three but one God? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the creator God. God made everything that is. John 1, 3, speaking of God the Son, Jesus Christ says, All things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. He made everything, everything that has come into being, that is, everything that has been created, he created. The only uncreated being is the one who created everything else. God never came into being. God has always been. He is the in the beginning God. When the beginning came, God was already there. He made everything else, and he made it. And here's the, the, the teaching of Genesis. He made it out of nothing. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created, is a big word there, the heavens and the earth. The word created is the Hebrew word for bara, which means to create or to initiate something new. It's different from fashioning or shaping or taking what's already there and making it. See, God didn't craft the world. He created it. Out of nothing is the idea. Significantly, this word is used only ever of God, never of human beings. Only God creates something out of nothing. Now, man is quick to say we create things, but God doesn't see it that way. We're modifying what he's already given us. Only God creates something out of nothing. Again, it's a teaching theologians call the ex nihilo. Uh, it's a Latin term meaning out of nothing. God made everything out of nothing. And again, if this sounds like too much, I'll just quickly tell you what the alternative is. That everything just came about and came out of nothing on its own. And I would say that is a stated belief by many who don't believe in God in this world. Uh, world-renowned physicist Stephen Hawking once wrote in his best-selling book, The Grand Design, that the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the, re the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists and we exist. So just think about this. Spontaneous creation means they believe that creation just happened. <laughs> there was nothing that could be agreed upon, but then there was something, but how it got there was, well, nothing is the point. Now, I'll just say this from someone who is going to take God's words literally, that he is the creator of all things. Remember our passage, Colossians 1. All things were created through him and for him. I'm going to believe that. Now, here's one thing I know. I don't understand the how of this creation. I know a lot of Christians spend a lot of time trying to explain how. I don't, I don't get all that. I don't know all of that. But what I know is right here in the beginning, I am being asked to believe that God is the origin of all of it. And if I see him as the designer behind it, I can find purpose in what he puts in front of me. And if God is not the beginning, then nothing is. Again, that title of Hawking's book, The Grand Design, is kind of ironic because 
if it is indeed, as he says, that the universe just arose out of nothing and created itself, then there is no grand design. And, and so I don't, I'm not sure if that was intended or not. Uh, but there was no designer. There was no design. There was no purpose is the point. We are all just little accidents, happy or not, chances that began from nothing. Now, we need to understand how important this belief is. What I believe about my origin has consequences. If God created us, we are his. We belong to him. How I live my life, what I do with this life as a gift from God matters because it's to be given back to the one I belong to. He made me. If God created you, you are not insignificant. This is one of the greatest tools that Satan has in this world is to get you to think there is no purpose, there is no reason, your life is meaningless, and if God created you, that's a lie. Even David understood this, knowing that God made him. He could say in some of the deepest and darkest times of his life, in Psalm 139, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Think, if God is your origin, you're made wonderfully. God's got purpose behind that. You are wonderful because God made you. And if God is your origin, your life and every life has meaning and purpose. And if God didn't create you, if every one of us is merely here by some great cosmic accident, then you have no meaning or purpose at all. There is no reason to respect any life, to observe any kind of morality. There's no reason to refrain from killing or injuring anyone or to seek any purpose in their life. There is no purpose in a godless, random universe. In the beginning, God changes everything. And look, I'm not just ranting. This is not just something your preacher is telling you. It's one of the stated beliefs of those who, who see a world without God. Uh, noted atheist Bertrand Russell wrote, unless you assume a God, the question of life's purpose is meaningless. Without an in the beginning God, we have no morality. We have no good. There is no good but God. And I understand that. You see, what we believe about creation has absolute consequences. And today, many reject the concept of God being our absolute creator for the simple fact they don't want to be accountable to that creator God. Because if he made me, I owe him. And I should listen to him, and I should obey him. And honestly, that's what Romans 1 is truly all about. That those who were created looked beyond the creator, understanding him to be God. Worshiped other things instead because their own interests were a priority. You see, those who reject our in the beginning God do not want to be accountable to God for their morality and for their eternity. And again, these are not just my thoughts. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the atheist German philosopher, wrote in the late 1800s, we deny God. In denying God, we deny accountability. See, what he wrote is what's behind the rejection of God in all of our lives. When we decide we know better of God, starts right there in the garden, by the way. When we know what God says, what God reveals, and yet we speculate we know a better way, we lose our purpose. We lose our focus. The Bible makes it very clear. It settles this in the first words. In the beginning, God created. And here's the last one I want us to think about this morning. It was always God's plan, God's purpose, God's presence to bring about redemption for everyone. In the beginning, God shows us that he is redeeming. He is the redeeming God. Uh, Genesis 3, and you can look at this, I'll put it up on your screen, brings Adam, Eve, and the serpent into judgment, right? There's, there's a little, little bit of funny business going on in the garden. God, of course, is aware of everything. And when all that takes place, he calls them all in to give an account in Genesis 3. You see, we're seeing. There are consequences for how you view this world. God is God and you are not. And so he calls them in to judge them. And in verse 15, God says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now that's more than just some poetic words put in the third, fourth pages of your Bible. In other words, what God is saying is, Satan, you're going to hurt the seed of woman but he will destroy you. Ultimately, you will be totally defeated by him. Now, these words in Genesis 3.15 are what theologians call proto-evangelium. Uh, uh, that is a Latin word for it, the first gospel. And I, I like that, that term. Think about this with me. 
I love the idea that God did not wait to preach the good news to the end of the story. He calls a shot. This is a very Babe Ruth moment. He points to the fences and say, you will be delivered. Satan will not win right here from the very beginning. This is the first indication in the Bible that God was going to send one of the seed of Eve from the human race is the idea to crush the serpent's head who had deceived mankind and win a victory and put humans back in right relationship with God. See, after Adam and Eve leave the garden, we, we, we start to see this trend in Scripture. And you've all, you've all seen it and probably ignored it. It's genealogies. Like, who really needs that? You've probably thought this, right? It, many times, especially in Numbers, it, it's just like reading through a Hebrew phone book. You're like, I don't need this. What's this all about? But have you noticed, time and time again, these genealogies show up? From Adam and Eve to Seth to Enosh to Methuselah to Noah to Shem to Ham to Japheth. Why? Why these lines of people? They appear in Genesis. They appear in the Old Testament. They, they actually start the Gospel of Matthew with a genealogy. Why is that? See, these genealogies are evidence that the promise God makes here in the telling of the first Gospel is going to come true. That through these people, God is working out this plan. And so Genesis 12, God tells Abraham that all the people of the earth will be blessed through your seed. It's a callback here. Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses makes this statement to Israel. There's a prophet coming after me greater than me. You should listen to him. God's working this plan. Psalm 110, David said that there was coming one who would be his Lord, and yet somehow his son, which makes you think. What's God doing? What's God preparing? Isaiah prophesied in chapter 53 that there was coming one on whom the Lord would lay the iniquities of us all on him. A callback again towards someone who was coming to crush the head of the serpent, to bring us back to God. So the first chapter in the New Testament opens with these words, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew's not just, you know, writing things that he thinks will get people. This calls you right back to what God was always doing. Jesus is the fulfillment of that first gospel. Jesus is the one to whom all these generations and prophecies pointed. Jesus defeated Satan and purchased us back to God, and this is exactly what he did. You think about this. Jesus didn't come to earth just to teach us like a teacher would teach us, so that like good students we can recite verses and tell them who the 12 apostles were. And he didn't just come to earth to sympathize with us, though he did teach us, and he did sympathize with us. The stated purpose of Jesus coming was that he would come not to be served, but to serve. And he came to serve others and give his life a ransom for many people. So here's what I'm saying this morning as we go into this year. There is an origin story that really matters. Jesus came to earth, God the Son, through the virgin birth, that word seed that we were looking at in Genesis today is right there in that first gospel verse. Seed would be human and yet something more because he's God's son as well. The seed of Eve fulfilling the promise God made. He went to the cross where Satan appeared to win. Don't you think it looked like Satan won that day? And the last disciple walked away and they shut themselves in a locked room for fear of what was coming next because God their Savior had died. Yeah, his heel was bruised. But on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead and he fulfilled the scripture which says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? He has crushed the enemy, destroyed the enemy for us. So now everyone who follows Jesus is forgiven of their sins and brought back into right relationship with God. And the truth is, what God always wanted from the beginning, he wants forever. To be with us in union, in peace. He wants to walk in the cool of the day forever, just as he stated in the beginning. And so we can look at Jesus, the fulfillment of this, and say, we thank God he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Genesis 3.15, the first gospel, is about. Again, I just point out, that is the origin story that makes the most impact in our lives, finds purpose for our lives. 
This first promise is what the whole rest of the Bible is about. Mankind fell into sin, but God raised up a people and he taught them and prepared them. And, and all of this promise that he gave them was going to come about. And I love this part of the story. Is that all those people God was working through, they so often let him down. God did so much in spite of us for us and brings his son into his world to save us, to crush the head of the enemy and give us victory over sin. And I would say this, if we don't get that, then we really don't understand what the whole of the Bible is about because from the beginning, God says this is it. You see, so many people look at the Bible as this, it's all these many books and there's all these random stories and you know, I don't quite grab this and I don't quite get it. The truth is it's all one story. And it all starts in these verses. And it'll make sense. You see, what you miss if you miss the beginning is that there's a unifying message that runs all the way through the Bible. And I will tell you this morning, it is not that complicated. Number one, God created everything good. Number two, we ruined it with our sin. Number three, thanks be to God, he promised and brought a redeemer to bring us back to him in a way we could never do on our own. And so here's the thought. That's what the whole book is about. It's, it's what summarizes all that God's trying to say in this simple way. God made things good. We mess things up, but God has sent a fixer in Jesus. And so listen, this is not just the story of the Bible lesson. The truth is, you're not getting everything out of Genesis, out of God's story, if you think it's just a story about what God did. It's a story about your life, too. God made us to know him and live with him forever. But we mess up. We sin and we reject God. But God still loves us and still sent this promised Messiah, Jesus, to die on the cross to save us, to bring us back into right relationship with him. You know, just like some see the Bible as a bunch of random stories, not seeing how it all fits together, so many people go through life that same way. Just a bunch of random events, just chaos, disorder. Because they're not fixated on what is God doing? Who is God in my life? How am I elevating him? There's no more, more, no real meaning, no real direction in your life if God's not at the center of it. He shows us how it all fits together. And that's where our purpose comes from. That's our origin purpose. That's why God gave us this book. So we could see what life is supposed to be like. And yes, when you fail to live up, turn to the God that forgives and brings you back close to him. It's to get out of our own orbit, to stop thinking that it's all about me or centered on me, but to get God on the throne where he belongs. The only way it'll work is to put God where he's supposed to be. And things will never come together in our lives. Things will never make sense fully in our lives until we really understand the meaning of this in the beginning God. God is everything. I want to say this today because we've got a lot of young people here as well. I love that we're going back through Genesis. We're kind of looking at how God gives purpose and, and meaning out of chaos and disorder. But doesn't life kind of seem like this where you can see the blessing of routine, right? Sun up, sun down, a day, it's good. We, we've got this routine. And in fact, there's even that, that really sweet blessing of God's mercies are new every morning. You know how long you have to wait for God's new mercies? It's like a 24 hours, and then they're new, and they're new. There's something about that that's a blessing. But very quickly, life can become meaningless and mundane and a do-over and a do-over and a Groundhog Day type of existence. And I want to clue you in, young people, because you right now are more thinking about what am I here for, what's my purpose in life, than at any time in your life probably. Like, what am I going to be? Where am I going to go to school? Who am I going to marry? What's my life look like? I want you to know this. If you get God where he belongs right now, all of that will line up like it's supposed to line up. No matter the chaos that surrounds you, you have an in-the-beginning God that brings purpose to every little choice you make. And Christians, that's the story for us. How easy is it for us to think, ugh, another day, another day, another day. What is right, as we look at the first four words of the Bible, is when you start your day, you say, in the beginning, God. My day starts with God. It will be filled by God. And I want to say this about purpose as well. 
Because I know the world teaches young people to look for their purpose and meaning. Um, and what they mean is, find what makes you happy. God never addresses purpose in terms of happiness. Never. Purpose is deeper than happiness. It's, it's greater. It, it finds contentment even when there is not happiness. Joy when there is sorrow. As we sang earlier, treasures when there are trials. God, God is so much bigger than the world's concept of purpose. So I want you to know this. When it appears like the darkness and the chaos is closing in, look for God's light. His purpose is greater. And he will see you through. He's not going to make you go through it alone. And that's one thing, again, that I find peace within this family. As Seth pointed out in our worship today, we don't suffer alone. Not only do we have each other, we have a Savior that suffered with us, knows our sorrows. More than that. We have a God that knows if we can learn something of treasure from these trials, we'll have something to lay at his throne one day. Well, this is our, our thought in Origins. We'll take a couple of weeks to, to, to express some ideas about it. But again, I thank you for your, your time, your attention this morning. If, if you're here and you don't yet know what it is uh, to have put on Christ in baptism, again, it's, it's just, there's so much meaning in such simple things with God. God says, I want to relate to you. I've sent my son to die for you. He bled. He, he was crucified. I raised him from death. You know how God has us come in contact with that blood? I want you to be baptized. Now, it, just on its surface, that seems like such an interesting concept, doesn't it? But what's it mean? It's about surrender. God says, I want you to recognize that you hear my word, you obey, you respond, you surrender, you submit. You'll be buried with my son. That's what Jesus ultimately did in giving his life. But Jesus didn't stay dead. God raised him from the dead. And that's one of the greatest things about baptism, by the way. He doesn't leave you in the grave. You're buried with him, and you're raised to walk in a brand new life. Not a perfect life. It'll be a hard life. In fact, I just leave you with one final encouragement this morning. It will be this. Your life will be hard and full of many troubles. That's, that's from Job. That's what life is, short, full of problems but your life will have meaning and purpose if you suffer through all these things for God. I love to think that when this life is over, we will walk in the cool of the day with our God. Paradise is awaiting. But for now, we walk with the faith that God has a reason for all we do.